Mark Simmons, autor del libro Free Willy to Killing Keiko, experto en evaluación de la salud y la recuperación de mamíferos marinos. You know, Keiko is sort of the son of Mexico. So to come here and have spent so much of my life and so, so much of my heart on that issue and to come here and to talk to, to this audience about Keiko is really a thrill to me. But there's a second reason that this story is really not known. To understand the relevance of this, I have to start by breaking your heart. Bar instincts, bar, bar all those other things we'll talk about, our lives are shaped by our awkward learning and what our experiences are, positive and negative. And you have to think about that history from birth with Keiko as you contemplate what he went through. So let's start. 1978, he was collected off the coast of Iceland at the approximate age of two years. In 1980, he's moved to Marine Land in Ontario, Canada, where he is with six other whales, and he's the low man on the totem pole. He's picked on, he's beat up, he's ostracized from the social group. In uh, 1986, he is moved to Reno Aventura, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce that exactly right, I have a flat tongue, uh, in Mexico City, here in Mexico City. Uh, at the approximate age of nine years of age. But ultimately, this is a male killer whale. So there were problems. But one thing that's never talked about is that Keiko was loved here. This began his real relationship with human beings, with his foster family. And that immensely positive relationship shaped the rest of his life. In 1996, Uh, Keiko has moved out of Mexico City to Oregon Coast Aquarium as the first phase of the release plan. The release plan at that point in time wasn't a plan. They had no idea what they were going to do. They just wanted to get him in colder water and get him off of all the special medications that he was on. Um, and they did that. They were successful in doing that. He also got immensely fat and lethargic, slow. Um, but other than getting off the medications, they spent all day playing with them. So those human relationships continued. The instinct theory, that instinct would kick in and that he would know what to do. There's a lot of debate over instinct theory. And if any of you are really interested in psychology, I recommend that you Google it. Instinct is essentially fixed action patterns. That means if I have a hand, I can grasp and drive forces, motivation factors to engage in that behavior. But beyond that, Instinct really doesn't play a significant role in our lives. Soon after birth, we start to learn and adapt to our environment, and that is operant learning. That is what shapes us. So these are the predominating theories that went into what's going to happen. Basically, they said, let's get him to Iceland. He gets in his own waters, and he'll show us the way. That was their quote. He'll show us the way. After five months, nothing was happening. Um, Keiko. He had a life with humans at this point. It had been 20 years with his human foster family and a very positive history. But let's take a look at how we know. These criteria were developed under commission by uh, two researchers by, from the U.S. Navy in 1993, and they became the standard. I'm not going to go through them, but what I want you to really focus on is that seven of these nine criteria are heavily vested in behavioral sciences, learning. These are the real challenges. The others are logistics and monitoring, and clinical, of course. Critical, that's a critical aspect, and that's a different story that Keiko really didn't qualify for. But these were, there, there are criteria for this, so it's not guesswork. So this is where I got introduced to the project, because after five months in Iceland, none of this was happening. Keiko was sitting around, he wasn't doing anything. He was, he was sedentary, he was still all day. He was next to his big blue boomer ball, his only companion and nothing else was happening, so they got scared. They said, we need to bring in experts, and boy, was there controversy, because I'm from the zoological field, but I've spent my entire career studying behavioral sciences, so they hired me to write the rehabilitation program and to implement it based in the empirical defined principles of learning, of science, so we did so. And we joined the project saying, you know what, there's really not a chance for this animal. All odds are against him. But if there's any chance at all, we're going to give him every chance that he can have. And we said, you know what, at the end of the day, it has to be based on the best interest of this animal. 
the decision ultimately has to be based on the best interest of this animal. Um, we got to get him in shape. He's got to lose weight. We've got to improve his response to opportunistic things in his environment. We've got to look for what makes him look and feel like a wild killer whale. Well, another little aspect here is that trainers, as good as we may be, we coddle, we love, we make excuses. Mother Nature is not that forgiving. She doesn't care if you had a bad day. And this is one of the things, there's all this talk about sanctuaries, you know, let's put our animals out there. These people have no idea how harsh the ocean environment is. It's, a, it's an ocean of acid. It wants to rip apart everything man puts together to put in it like it's a joke. And then it set us back six weeks. So this idea, this Hollywood fantasy that life is so simple, it hurts me when I hear this because this is not how it works, ladies and gentlemen. It's not how it works at all. And it's, that's not taking into consideration this animal and his needs are going to be threatening to those pods of killer whales. So let's go back to this family theory that they say, and they still say today, well, if we had found this family, he would have succeeded. Let me tell you something. We did biopsy guarding. We did DNA and genetic testing. We identified the same genomes as Keiko. We found his family. Makes no difference. If you were born and raised by a foster family, do you think you'd magically be able to walk through a crowded shopping mall and recognize your mother? These animals are not magic. Without human support and companionship for those five years, this 22 days is the only time that he was without his human support and his human companionship. Fast forward a year of that life. And in December 12, 2003, Keiko died in the evening, Thursday evening. This was not, contrary to what's told in the public, this was not a sudden death by any stretch of the imagination. This was the onslaught of chronic negative stress induced by deprivation from his human family, by starvation in slow measures because instead of 120 pounds a day, they gave him 20 pounds every other day to keep him hungry. So he'd go out and look for his own fish and he'd go frolic with wild whales, but that didn't happen. He exhibited all sorts of behavioral neuroses, aberrant behavior. Slamming his head against boats that were in the bay, throwing fits out in the middle of the bay, sometimes sitting there so calm it didn't create even a ripple of water. It, I hope this is breaking your heart because every time I think about it, it breaks my heart.